Good day, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Kim Schofield, Managing Partner of O2K Limited, and today I am your host for Inspiration Tuesdays. We really appreciate you joining us for our very first program. Inspiration Tuesdays is going to host guests from all over the world that have been an inspiration to their industries, colleagues, and communities. Today, we are gonna talk about the power of inspiration, which is a very necessary ingredient for recovery, surviving and thriving post-2020 and COVID-19. Our guest today, Dave Crane, is one of the most infamous names in public speaking and inspirational program. He is a UAE icon who has emceed the Emirates Airline Dubai Rugby Sevens for over 20 years. Dave has been a true source of inspiration to thousands of people worldwide during the COVID crisis. Two days after the global pandemic struck, Dave and his business partner, Anessa Verdugo, launched a brand new web TV show, The Toilet Paper Diaries. And for 50 consecutive days, they helped people living in lockdown worldwide cope with the pressures of quarantine. The show covered, covered everything from mental health to reinventing your business to effective leadership and cybersecurity. And on the 50th show, he had an incredible 25 guests, including royalty, industry icons, thought leaders, celebrities, top authors, high achievers, and radio TV personalities. I would like to welcome Dave Crane to Inspiration for Tuesdays. Thank you so much, Dave, for being here. Well, what a great intro. Thank you so much. The thing is, everything you said there, as I'm, I'm listening, go, wow, this guy sounds really interesting. I wonder who he is. And then you say, Dave Crane at the end, and go, oh, him, he's back again. Who made up all that stuff about him? It is true. I have done all those things. But the interesting thing is, when you, when, I mean, I haven't had a CV for 30 plus years. I've had no need to write one out because I don't want to work for anybody. I love doing what I do. And every single thing in it, doesn't seem like a wow when you're in the middle of it. It's just a gig or it's just an event or it's just something that I've done. And I really love the idea that you can only you can only really read life backwards by looking at what happened. When you're in it, it's like a fish looking for water, saying, where's this water stuff I've heard so much about? And you're going to say, well, no, you're in it. That's exactly what it is. And I feel my life is like that anyway. Who or what inspired you to begin your career in, in journalism, social media? Well, that's a great question. I used to, I used to grow up wanting to be on stages with Michael Jackson. Now, obviously, when you're a kid, he was a hero. Much later on, you go, no, I don't want to go anywhere near Michael Jackson, <laughs> especially if I was a kid then. But, but I look back at that. And what I wanted to be was I wanted to be famous. And it wasn't for all the trappings of money and all the celebrity and stuff. I realize in retrospect, probably looking at it now, it was about significance. It was about the ability to not be ignored. Now, that's not so important for me now. It is still quite important because I demand that when I'm working, but if it's not worth it, I'll do it a different way. But it's not because I don't, I'm not humble. I don't enjoy what I do and I don't want to help people. It's just a way of gauging to see if it's having an impact. So if I'm doing something that nobody's paying any attention to and I can't see any value in doing it, then why am I still doing it? But there are things I do that don't have a huge impact but are very significant to me and make a big difference and I'll put everything into it and make sure it still works. So as for who inspired me at a very early age, I've got to say as many people would say my dad because as a role model, he was very cool. Very, he's still with us, thank goodness. But he's very cool, cool in the way he, he deals with things. We, we argue a lot more now than I've ever done in my entire life with my dad yeah. because we're both grumpy old men. Um, but he, he helped me understand the world in a way that allowed me to navigate in later life with certain principles and th certain things I wouldn't allow to happen and certain things that were very important values to have for your family and for the way that you grow. So that was that was that that was clear. In terms of my roadmap, I think Tony Robbins, when I first read his books, made a huge difference. I was kind of lost from not being a student anymore. And I was ba basically trying to find out how I get from A to B because everyone around me had no idea. Reading Tony Robbins' stuff allowed me to, to see that there were a bigger picture of that. And also with Jack Canfield, his stuff really inspired me as well. But the, that question is often asked to me, who do you see as your mentors? Who do you see as your inspirational guys? I don't really have any. I enjoyed their books. 
But I certainly don't spend my time going, oh, wow, you know, they're great and all the rest of it. There's a, there's a British uh, hypnotist called Paul McKenna, who's a very famous guy in the UK. And he was a radio DJ who transformed himself into a, a personal development guru using NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming and so on. And I remember when I was a DJ, I was wanting to be a DJ um, years ago when I was a, like a teenager or a student. He was on the radio, then suddenly he dropped away and disappeared from the radio. He was okay on the radio, wasn't brilliant, and then became this stage hypnotist doing shows on TV, and then, you know, this, this uh, therapist guru. And I, I met him and worked with him years later, but I always remember that sometimes you've got to leave the comfort to go into a different zone that will work for you. And that later inspired me to understand and read what is an incredibly dull book, but a really brilliant strategy called the Blue Ocean Strategy. Right? Rather than fighting in red oceans that are full of blood with everyone fighting over the price and, and little advantages, you're looking for a blue ocean that's clear, where you can sail in any direction and you're on your own, but it's a beautiful place to be. And I've always seen that, but I found it in practical terms, watching Paul McKenna make the change he made. Now, I love what he does. I think he's a really smart guy and I have and I spent time with him and he's a really good guy. Um, I don't feel so much that um, these people I look up to, in many ways, I see them as benchmarks of which I've got to learn lessons from what they've done and say, right, you've got to apply that to what you do. But not because I want to be like them. I don't want to. I'm happy one day dying a short, fat, black, old, old bloke <laughs> with dreadlocks that don't seem very appropriate for a man of his age. Um, with a big smile on my face, that would be fine by me. And people might turn around and say, wow, wasn't Dave great? Or they might say, could you put that in the corner, please? I can't get to my sandwiches. I don't care. I'll be dead. But I do want it to be an inspiration for my daughter. Mm -hmm. So um, two things. First of all, that she can see there's a roadmap different to what the world gives her. And secondly, mm -hmm. because people who hopefully have met me will be kind to her on her adventures. And... That's pretty much how it goes. I hate being in a comfort zone because I, I've never really been given one. So when COVID kicked in and everyone went into lockdown and everyone's fearful for their jobs as well as their, their health and everything, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm fearful for my health. But as for my job, I've never had one. As we established, I've always gone mm -hmm. out to hunt and uh, you can only eat what you kill. Nobody hands you anything. Nobody mm -hmm. turns around and says, Dave, you know what? For that hard work you put in, Welcome to the gang. Here's a palace and a car and all these people will get you whatever you want. No, that's not it. When they work with me, it's because they look at me and say, right, um, who else can we get apart from Dave? Nobody. Well, he must be the best at what he does. Okay, how much does he want? Let's get him in. And mm -hmm. I'm happy with that because that means I've worked in a direction, achieved a certain level, mm -hmm. and it means that they're not getting me by accident. They get me because I'm the best at what I do. That's and right. that's, that's a benchmark I can push. That's a, that's that's fantastic, um, and we should all you know aspire to that to that benchmark to do our best to be the best, and when people reach out to us, it's because they they want us because we're the best at what we do. So, uh, sorry, I was just going to reply to you. I don't think we all should. I think that it's about imagine we're in a massive swimming pool, and some people find it really easy to just walk tread water. Some people are doing lengths and breadths. Some people are teaching other people to swim. Some people stay above water because they hold on to people who are going down and jump onto another person who's going down. And yes. some people have a different strategy by creating a boat. I think you have to find your own way through life. And mm -hmm. I can't tread water. If I tread water, I go invisible and go under the surface. So I have to keep, keep paddling. Sometimes it looks beautiful. Most of the time it looks terrible with little, my little feet going under the surface. So for some people, they'll go through life saying, you know, it seems so easy. I don't know what people are complaining about. And that can be for lots of different reasons. The reason I want to apply this, and I don't want to take us to a different subject, is when recently people have said to me about, you know, um, um, what we call about institutional racism. It doesn't exist. I've never seen it. People are just making it up and just being paranoid. Trust me, it exists. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't a direct reflection of never being given anything. And if you've got me and somebody else on the same, going for the same job, if they're not of color, I won't get it. And also, um, I found for many years, and that's one of the reasons I left the BBC, left the, left the UK. When I worked for the BBC, I was a freelancer for three years and I was working when they needed me. 
I wanted to become a staff member. And I went for a number of job interviews up and down the country. Many of them were for people of color only because I realized that I had a problem getting enough um, diversity into the BBC, mm -hmm. which is good. But I found that I was a top DJ in my region. Mm -hmm. I was, um, I ran a magazine. I was a news, a qualified journalist and news reporter and presenting on many other radio stations for charity or for community, but I still couldn't get a staff job at the BBC. And at some point I thought, what do they want from me to turn around and say, this is a big hitter? So I ended up going on a TV show called Blind Date, which is a dating game in the, in, in the US. And I won the Christmas show where they said, this is a guy we've got to get on. So I won the Christmas show with 20 million people watching. When I went back in, everyone else was going, great show, great show, well done, Dave. The BBC turned around to me and said, we can see you've got a different direction to where we are, so we're going to let you go in that direction. And mm -hmm. they let me go. They stopped hiring me. And it was really significant for me because here's me trying to go, daddy, 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 I'm the right guy for you. They used it as an excuse to get rid of me. Mm -hmm. I ended up leaving the UK shortly after because I was so disgruntled with the whole country because I felt that this was endemic and, again, systematic. I went to Dubai, which, as you know, it's a, it's, it's a brown country, but it's a mixed-coloured country. So mixed for country. Everybody. You know, it's, everybody's out here. And I found that within two years of being in Dubai, I was a station manager at a radio station. They wouldn't give me a proper full-time job in the UK, but I'm running a station in one of the most exciting countries in the world because what they did was they said, oh, you think you can do it? Well, go on then. Every time I go home, I always get asked, well, what, you know, what's it like being in the UAE? What's it like being a woman in the UAE? And my favorite response is, tell you what, guys and gals, it is much easier to, to achieve your dreams here than it is where I'm from, the US. And everybody looks at me, okay, well, what? I said, I've never been treated disrespectfully. I've never not been given an opportunity because I was a female. And right now, you know, with the majority of women graduating from school, a majority of, of graduates from school are women. And, uh, and, and, you know, this country is doing such a wonderful job of making sure that women have opportunities. Uh, you know, this is a, this is a great, it's a great place to be um, for, for, for all of, all of those things. But I do want to help. I, I, I'm just going to say, I agree with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I want to go back and ask you something because, you know, it takes, you know, for you to pursue the, the career in journalism for then you, then to say, I've had enough and, and go to Dubai, you know, you get that, that strength, that strength didn't just happen. It happens when you're young. So you made a couple comments. You said, you know, you would like, you know, with the pursuit of your career, one of the things that's very important to you is the ability to not be ignored. And also how it's important to be able to leave your, leave your comfort zone and have your own way through life um, or find your own way through life rather. So when you were a child, was there any specific event or program or happening that Mate, was the foundation shape, shaped who you are today, you think? Yeah, and I didn't realize it until later on when I did a therapy session with a friend of mine. When I was about two years old, um, me and my school friends were going to play in each other's houses, as you do when you're about two, three years mm -hmm. old. But one of the kids down our street, I remember going to their house and the mum closed the gate on me and wouldn't let me in. Now, this is oh, the my. 70s. It's yeah. like um, a different world hopefully yeah. a different world in many ways it's not a different world unfortunately and she wouldn't let me in and I didn't get it I went home and that was it as you're a kid you don't ask all those questions oh my goodness I have to get my video recorder out and name and shame her on LinkedIn oh, yeah. or, or, or Instagram you don't think like that you just go home and I realized that that experience had set me up in many different ways for believing that I was never part of anybody's gang because that formative time then made me realize subconsciously, I didn't realize it properly, that um, I will never be part of anybody. Sometimes I get accepted, sometimes I don't, but just be prepared for disappointments. And so that allowed me to try lots of different things. But I realized that what I was waiting for was for somebody to turn around and say, that's our guy. But when it didn't get to that, 
What I ended up doing was punching as high as I could in my own natural weight to the point where the only thing missing is a hand up from somebody above me and then I'd stop. And so I've got a massive CV of lots of really strong disciplines, but very few of them actually get to a point where you say, this guy is a guru at it. And that's mm-hmm. because I stopped doing them. You know, for instance, played rugby, ran athletics, did a number of different things where the next thing is to join the top table, but there was no invite, so I stopped. And it took a real life lesson for me to realize I won't be invited to top tables, so why don't I just make my own? So then I took, I I reviewed who I am and what I do, the life coaching, the healing, the business coaching. And I went, you know what? Why don't you go down what you're brilliant at? And at the same time, it's combined with the idea of the hedgehog concept, which Mm -hmm. the hedgehog concept is a brilliant thing from Jim Collins in his books, Good to Great and Built to Last, where he examined companies that lasted for a hundred years. And what did they do that meant that after the founder had created this organization as a family business, their kids took over as a family business and then their grandkids didn't want to take over the business because they liked the Lamborghinis and thought it was their natural right. The company would fall to bits unless they had governance, unless they had certain things in place that made sure that they had a management structure underneath the kids that would allow the company to continue. So with that, he created a thing called the hedgehog concept, which I've since realized is uh, very similar to the Ikigai which goes back thousands of years in in, in Japanese uh, culture. And it's it's basically three circles, like a Venn diagram, one here, one here, and one on top. So the three circles interlock. And one circle is what are you potentially the best in the world at doing? The next one is what are you passionate about doing? And the third one is what's the business model? How can you be paid for doing it? And I learned this and I loved it and I applied it in many cases and I help people all the time to find their hedgehog. The idea of being a hedgehog is a pretty boring rodent until Mm. it curls up in a ball with its spikes on the outside and then nothing natural can get at it. So you've got to find what you do in life. That's like that. So I realized what have I done that I'm really good at? Well, I'm brilliant at talking to a live audience anywhere, whether it's thousands of people or a small group of people or entertaining. I've done it for like so many years, 50 years, believe it or not, this year. Um, And what do I love doing? I love helping and coaching people. So how could that help me find a business model? What if I help and coach people to be able to talk to audiences and market themselves and create a brand? Would people pay for that? The answer is yes, but I've got to optimize it. Who would pay best? top end people, CEOs, decision makers, ambassadors, people who are at the top end who, if they don't get it right, it costs them a million dollars because they didn't look as good as the other person. They want to be Steve Jobs, Richard Branson. They want to be effective. So they'll hire my services because without me, they don't get it. You are, I don't, how do you, how do you maintain your work-life balance? I mean, you work harder than anybody. I, I know up at 530 already online and every single day, nonstop. How do you maintain a work-life balance? I'm up at four because I now have a regime of breathing and meditating. Oh, I do for an hour before good. I wake up. Well, yeah, the breathing, you need it. <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm working with the Art of Living and Sky Schools to um, put together a process where your breathing is so, oh my goodness, the different types of breaths that you take, the, it's, it's like food. People don't consider the way they breathe to be so important, but it carries so much weight. So I do a 45 minute breathing routine every morning before I start the day for stress management and balance and, and, and thought process. So, so that's brilliant. So what drives me is simple. I wrote an article about exactly this on LinkedIn and I do an hour every day or two hours every day more than my competition. And it's not because I'm not good. It's because they might be better. They might be younger. They might be more savvy. But one thing I can do is I can outwork them. So if I take two hours every morning to put in an extra two hours, it actually works out to be something like 28 days extra a year that I have over my competition. I get a whole month of work. So I decided to call this extra month Maya, my daughter's name. So I get 13 months a year, everyone else gets 12 months a year. I can achieve a lot more. I'm doing it directly for my gorgeous daughter who's 10 now. And it all falls into my own personal ecosystem. I fear 
all the time about being ineffective. And that's probably from being a, being young and not having the opportunity to have anything hand out to me. I know that if I don't make it happen, it won't happen. So that drives me and it does exhaust me. And lockdown has meant I'm probably working longer hours than ever before because there's no traffic. All of us are, right. I don't, I don't leave the house unless I'm going shopping or going on a, on a brief visit or a meal, brief meal. Um, so I put in more hours. I do fall asleep in this gorgeous chair I have. I de- deliberately bought a recliner so I could press a button and it just turned into a bed. So sometimes my family come in and say, just leave daddy, we'll call him later on. But it means I'm a lot more productive. It means I'm talking to people all around the world and I'm really mm-hmm. fast tracking. This year, I'm talking to such influential people. I would have had to live in their country to, to maybe get a meeting with them, maybe. Now, we're on Zoom calls. And we're on first-name basises. Or bases. I don't know what, what plural is. And so it's been an... I, I love where we are right now. I just adore it. Yeah, I mean, at COVID-19, I think one of the, the... One of maybe the only positives of COVID-19 is the fact that we can easily communicate with everybody around the world. And it's opened up so many doors that would maybe not have even been opened up otherwise, you know? Completely. It, 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 held, it held a mirror up to everybody and it showed you the, the, the good, the bad and the ugly of everything we have. It shows mm-hmm. us if we don't care about each other, then we'll not wear a mask and we'll catch stuff and we'll kill others. If we do care about each other, then we'll let others know that there's a problem in advance so they can do something about it. It lets us know that when we work on things, we can be connected with incredible people all around the world and share information and grow. Mm -hmm. I mean, the digital world we're in now is 10 years away that happened now because we had to. If you, I mean, people are reinventing their work because they've got no choice because they can't go out and do 90% of what they used to do as a proper job. So I think that it's an enabler and it really holds up those who can't get, who, who are not making the world a better place because they haven't adapted to it yet. That's a, that actually brings me to, a, to an interesting question. So what role do you think inspiration plays in helping the world get back on its feet now post COVID-19? Inspiration, that's a brilliant question. Your questions are amazing, by the way. Um, Here's the thing. Inspiration is like a fuel. Mm -hmm. So you need to be inspired to get to a new place. But then again, if you're in a swimming pool and you're starting to drown, inspiration doesn't play any part. Flapping your arms and legs and holding your head up does. Mm -hmm. So inspiration is like being able to put essential oils in the room while you're working. It makes it easier for you to get there and a better ride. Inspiring people, motivating people is probably gonna be the, the, the vaccine to the mental health pandemic mm-hmm. that half the world is going through and doesn't know it's going through. And the other half has managed to get by because they've been too busy. So inspiration and motivation have a massive job to play. And I think that COVID brought out the best and the worst. I hope that afterwards the technology will force us to have to realize that the the machines are doing a lot of the old heavy lifting we used to do. So Mm -hmm. maybe humanity has got to play a new part because that has a value that can't be replaced. Well, you know, well then perhaps the role of, of, of government and inspiration is, is developing the strategic vision like this country's done with 2030 to to invest in education infrastructure but infrastructure as it i mean evolving education infrastructure and, and stay with the times to invest in things like space um which yeah. touches every everybody i mean everybody it benefits from the space economy um i you know so i mean maybe maybe that's the role of government an inspiration. In, in a perfect world, it is. And, and the thing is, you're saying 2030. They actually have plans up to 2070. Yeah, right. Now, they do. that only works if you're not going to have disruption in the timeline of your management of the country. Well, you still... Because... You know, sorry, go on. I was going to say, well, you know, it's like anything. You can, you can drive anywhere if you don't have a map and know where you're going. At least if you know where you're going... Yeah, you're going to have deviations along the way, but you know what your you know what your objective is, and you know that 
hey, there's the, the road is out ahead, so we're going to have to have a detour, but at least you know, you know where you're going, and I think that's, that's a really important thing. Well, one, one last question, Dave. Um, you know, not everyone feels inspired, no matter what, no matter, no matter who is around them, no matter what they're surrounded by. There's just some people that, that just don't feel very inspired. Yeah. What advice would you give to someone who needs some inspiration in their life? Um, Google it. Simple. <laughs> That's what it's there for. If you a ask better questions. So if you're saying, if your internal dialogue says, you know, I'm fat and I'm old and nobody's interested in me, then you've got rubbish internal dialogue. Ask yourself a better question. What can I do to feel younger? What can I do to lose weight? How can I, how can I interact with people better? Because your brain's a supercomputer. Artificial intelligence is not there by accident. It's trying to reproduce what we do naturally and we still do it better. So when you ask yourself better questions, your brain goes, oh, Okay, different question. How can I lose weight? Let's Google it. Lose weight by doing this and this and this. And what can I do to inspire it? Maybe I can do some, I can do some videos and share with people my journey. And maybe I can connect with some. And it starts coming up with brilliant ideas. So you ask better questions. The, the, the way that we make ourselves better is, first of all, in business, always remembering it's not about them. It's about us. What's in it for them? Don't care about what's going on for you. Nobody cares what, what's good for us. Right. We care what's in it for them. So have that as a met metric and always keep pushing it. Get out of your comfort zone, take more risks than ever before. Remember that, I mean, even like whenever I, I stopped reading inspirational books about 15 years ago. And the reason I stopped reading them is because my brain was saturated with the amount that I'd already read. All people <laughs> do is regurgitate the same, the same stuff anyway. So when I say, I won't mention names because it's unfair, but some of the latest gurus mm -hmm. who come up with something, people go, wow, have you ever seen that? I went, yeah, Jim Rohn talks about that. And Earl Nightingale talks about that. And Norman Vincent Peale talks about that. I mean, 100 years ago. It's just being regurgitated for a new audience, like, like rap music and disco music. You know, were taken from stuff that happened from, from before, and, and house music was 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 taken from from disco music and so on. And so, it does go full circle. What I would say is make motivation and inspiration part of your diet, and read on a regular basis. Music's good, but you know what? It's there. It's done. Read talking books if you can't read a physical book get Blinkist or one of these apps that allows you to in 15 minutes read a brilliant book go on to google i've been reading some incredible books recently one of them is by daniel um daniel Priestley, and i'm going to throw some numbers at you because they're really inspirational and these are things that people should write down seven eleven and four i'm going to tell you, give you two sets of numbers first one is seven eleven and four do you know what these numbers are to get somebody to know, like, and trust you, they have to spend seven hours in your company, have 11 different interactions with you, and four different places where they met you. That's online and offline. Reading your material, chatting to you, seeing you being interviewed, 11 different... Isn't that interesting? That is a very interesting fact, yes. And four different places. So if all you do is LinkedIn and you don't do anything else and you don't meet people, and you don't get interviewed, then that's only one place. You need four different places. Another set of numbers I'm going to give you is 50, 12, 10, and 2. Mm -hmm. 50 leads turns into 12 appointments, which then turns into um, 10 sales presentations, which turns into two mm -hmm. closed deals. Yep, that, sound, that does sound about right. So with these numbers in hand, these actually come from Daniel Priestley, who in his book Over, um, Oversubscribed talks about this as well as other things. Now, I want to read his book. I will read his book, but I don't have a lot of time. So I went on Google and I went on YouTube and I put Oversubscribed, an explanation or explainer. And in five minutes, somebody had done a, a, um, a whiteboard animation of the best bits of his book. So I got that and I thought, that's wonderful. I, I need more than that. So I went and I saw a 45 minute into, uh, presentation he gave at some stage in London and he explained all these things. So within an hour, I now have a new me metric for my business. If like many people, you go, oh, the sales aren't happening. No, the sales are happening. You just need to look at the 50, 12, 10, 2 and get 10 times the amount of leads. Yeah, exactly right.
That's and a, that's probably always that been right? there, but you never knew it until we've had this conversation now. Yeah. It's not saying you never knew, you clearly knew, but but people who are watching might not know those numbers. So motivation yeah. is different for everybody. Some people are, are, are inspired by, by staring out the window or doing yoga or meditation. Some people are inspired by music. Some people mm -hmm. are inspired by, by um, wealth. Some people are inspired by just feeling happier. No problem. They all work. You got to eat. Remember That's that? That's right. Bit? That's right. You got to eat. So find the right balance for you. Your work-life <laughs> balance. Start off of a life wheel. Google that. And then find what you need to do to supply that. Ask better questions. If my health is rubbish, what do I need to do to improve my health? And then keep asking questions all the way down until you get your answers. Well, fantastic, Dave. Is there anything else you'd like to add or answer that I didn't ask? No, I just wanted to say that I love your series. I think it's a brilliant thing to do. I love having chatted with you in the past. You've got a wealth of knowledge. And you've got a wealth of incredible guests and friends through your time working in business. I can't wait to see who you've got lined up in future episodes. And I think anybody watching your show will not only have an incredible treat, inspiration, motivation, and great business knowledge, but also they should share that with other people because it will change their mm. lives. So congratulations on your show. I love it. And I'm a fan. Well, thank you so much. That means a lot to me, especially coming from you. Now, how can other people find you if they, if they want to reach out? Google Dave Crane. The fastest answer is that. The short, the, the, the slightly longer answer mm -hmm. is connect with me on LinkedIn because most of my content goes out there. Um, subscribe to me on YouTube. Go to speakonstage.com if you want to learn how to speak mm -hmm. and communicate better. And if you want to work with me, go to bookdavecrane.com. And then you'll find me. But just basically Googling Dave Crane. Don't go for David Crane, because that's the guy who wrote Friends. Mm -hmm. Go for Dave Crane, and then you'll find me. And you'll always be able to tell, because I look a bit like this. So there's plenty <laughs> of stuff out there. And uh, let me know how I can help you. I train industry icons. I train people to be able to fast track through their industry by being much more effective in what they do. And I think that that is a new metric for people being able to be successful in business, because your name is your brand. So therefore, if you want your business to be more successful in a busy marketplace where you've got 7 billion people, let's face it, not the location anymore, but what you can find online, you better have a reputation and be a person of influence, again from Daniel Priestley, a key person of influence, who when they find you, they can say, wow, this person has put the time in, they've got the success, and they can deliver. That's what I train people to do. Very good. Well, Dave, your accomplishments drive enthusiasm are an inspiration for us all. Thank you so very much. Um, for our audience, you can find this uh, video on, on YouTube and our YouTube channel, Chief Inspiration Officer. And we'll have links on LinkedIn and WhatsApp and our various groups. Um, please stay tuned for our next episode, the 6th of January. We will welcome Francesco Rulli, Chief Executive Officer of Carlo, a philanthropist who has raised millions of dollars and leveraged social platforms to connect over 55,000 female students in Afghanistan to the World Wide Web. He will join us on the next program. So thank you. This is Kim Schofield. Thank you very much. Have the very happiest of holidays and all the best for a healthy, prosperous, and COVID-free New Year's. And just remember what Dave said. He said, inspiration is the vaccine for the mental health issues post-COVID-19. Thank you very much. Have an awesome day.